Kevin Powell is no stranger to Brooklyn audiences. A resident of Clinton Hill, he ran for U.S. Congress in 2008 and 10, and has been at the front lines as an activist around social and political issues that affect communities of color and young men in particular. He's the founder of the nonprofit national nonprofit organization BK Nation and has published articles in magazines and publications like Esquire, Vibe, Essence, and The Washington Post. But today, Kevin's here to talk about his new autobiography, The Education of Kevin Powell, A Boy's Journey into Manhood. And by the way, he'll be signing that book tonight at Greenlight, book, Greenlight Bookstore right here in Fort Greene, just down the block. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. This is live, right? This is live. The uh, book signing is actually tomorrow night, Wednesday night. It's tomorrow night. Yeah. It's tomorrow night, folks. So you've got a chance to bone up tonight, <laughs> get your copy, read it, and then have something interesting to say besides sign my book tomorrow when you show up. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. It took you a few years to get here. Yeah, man. Uh, so I ran for Congress here in the area in 2008, 2010, which was a fascinating experience. It's in the book. It's definitely in the book. <laughs> um, and I have no regrets. It was wonderful. I learned a lot. But um, I'm a writer. This is my 12th book. I've been writing since I was a child. Uh, and I said I needed to write something that I felt spoke to our times, you know. And uh, it was very therapeutic, very healing. Uh, it's a very personal book. Um, I'm happy to get bl uh, blurbs from people like Eve Insler and Gloria Stein and Bell Hooks, people I love yeah. and admire. And uh, the response has been incredible. Uh, I say to people, this is the most important thing I feel I've written in my life. Uh, I don't know if it's the best thing. I can't say that. Other folks will have to say it. But it's all there. It's something that I've been thinking about for 20 years since I was a much younger writer. Yeah. Tell us about this photo we're seeing here. You ah. talk about it in the book, but tell us about it. I was three years old. That's the first professional photo shoot I ever had, and I didn't want to uh, cooperate. So that's Where's what your arm? My, my mother was like, uh, "Can you?" The, I, I just didn't want to be bothered. I just like you know. But there's my little uniform and uh, and my big head and big ears. <laughs> Same guy. I couldn't. I couldn't think of anything else. And I've actually gone through phases with a lot of hair, like you have, which I, I love. You know, mm -hmm. then we were talking about short hair. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, here I am, back full circle to that picture, which is wild to me. You know. I love it. So you are young. You mm -hmm. haven't cracked. I'm in my 40s. You haven't cracked 50. Not yet. Yet you're writing mm -hmm. a biography, and you said like you were very truthful. It was so revelatory here. You really laid out so much stuff like no one can say something bad about Kevin Powell uh, and that you, hasn't already right and you been laid out warts and all so where well, did you get the courage to write so honestly I'm an artist I mean y'all have artists in this great space and I'm glad to be back here because it's actually been a couple years since I've been here because of this book and this yeah. is wonderful um, and thank y'all for having me um, I think if you're true to your art you have to tell the truth about who you are um, my heroes and sheroes are people like uh, Lauren Hill, like Lord Nero, like Bob Marley, like Joni Mitchell, like Carol King, you know, people who have used art as therapy, not just for themselves, but also to share with the world. Uh, you know, I talk about Tupac Shakur in that book, um, you know, how vulnerable he was, even right. with all his issues, you know, that I talk about. And I just think that um, in telling your own truth, and I do it in my work as an activist here in New York and around the country and even internationally, you'll be surprised at how many folks will come up to you. One of my favorite stories, I was at the Langston Hughes Centennial in 2002 in Kansas, and I read a phone call for Aunt Kathy about my, my aunt, who's a black woman, yeah. who uh, had, a, had a mental breakdown, ended up being institutionalized. When I finished the poem, a white sister came up to me and she said, I'm Aunt Kathy, too. Wow. That's when you know that art touches people in different kinds of ways, regardless of our race, our culture, our sexual identity. I mean, we're all sisters and brothers, and I hope that people can see that from the book, you know. It's not an easy read, yeah. but I wanted it to be uh, truthful and hopefully healing for people at the end of the day. Yeah. Absolutely. Speaking of your aunt, you were born and raised by your mother and aunt yeah. in Jersey City, yes, right? You moved here to oh. New York 25 years ago. A long time ago. Eventually making your way to Brooklyn. And if I may yeah. quote you here, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm going to read a little bit one of these beautiful uh, excerpts about you kind of discovering Brooklyn okay. uh, in particular. So Nelson George's writings, the films of Spike Lee and Brooklyn rap star Big Daddy Kane, my favorite solo hip-hop artist ever, as he should be, placed Brooklyn solidly at the center of my universe. When I finally made the move to New York City, I assumed that it would be to Harlem, drenched as it was in the history of Malcolm X, of Langston Hughes, of James Baldwin, and the Harlem Renaissance. But Brooklyn captured my imagination like no other place. Whenever I went to an event, be it a party or community gathering, Brooklyn folks always traveled in large packs. <laughs> and they always represented Brooklyn loud and proud. So this is a really kind of particular 
um, experience at that time. Moment. Yes, yeah. absolutely. How do you feel about Brooklyn now? Whoa, <laughs> I'm forever uh, in love with Brooklyn. You know, that's not going to change. Uh, Seventy neighborhoods, over 100 different ethnic groups and languages spoken in this borough. Um, you know, we're our own country, really. Mm -hmm. Three million people. Um, but I would be remiss if I said it, it hasn't saddened me all the shifts that have happened. You know, um, I was living in this area when Erica Badu was not even known, when most staff used to be on corners, you know, spitting mm -hmm. rhymes and stuff like that. You know, um, Brooklyn's always been diverse. I just want to see Brooklyn continue to be a space where working class people of all ethnic backgrounds and, and artists are able to live here and thrive. That's really, really important because those are the folks who made Brooklyn happen. Even if you look at uh, pop culture, The Honeymooners was based in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Sunday mm -hmm. Fever was based in Brooklyn. Those were working class characters, you know what yes. I'm talking about? And so that you know, Spike Lee's do the right thing. And so Brooklyn should be for everyone, you know, that's how I feel. Um, and I, I tell you, whenever I go around the world, I, I say Brooklyn is like instant reaction. Even, mm. You know, even my company's called Brooklyn Jersey Boy because I have to represent both, but Brooklyn's first, you know what I'm saying? So going back to the book now, who do you think? How do you think? get your hair like that? <laughs> It's amazing. The book, man. But really, I'm not the first guest to actually that. I'm not. Like this. I read the book. I have. But how do you? Who do you think this book is for? When you were writing, are you speaking to that young man who you're like mentoring now and the young people? Great question. Yeah. Like who? Who did you think you were writing this? for? Everyone. Anyone, yeah. uh, you know, I want women to read it. I want girls to read it. Uh, I did a great conversation with another network last week, and we talked a lot. Of, it was October, so it was uh, Domestic Violence right. Awareness Month. I talked a lot about gender issues, gender mm -hmm. violence, you know, mm -hmm. redefining manhood. Uh, I want people of different cultures to read this book, you know. We actually have reading groups that have already popped up in Brazil and South Korea, uh, which is crazy to me. So this this is like this kind of thing happening with this book that I, that's really surprising to me. And I, I'm... I'm humble about it, but I've been blessed to be in a lot of different spaces, you know, to go from poverty to MTV to working for Quincy Jones Vibe magazine to running for office. I don't take it for granted that I've been able to be in these different spaces. So I'm hopefully, you know, my work means that I can bridge, be, be a bridge builder for different types of people with this book. That's my plan. Yeah. Is there a particular moment in the book that you want, uh, want to share with us? Uh, uh, maybe to hook everyone in if they haven't already read it. You mean just grab the book and... Feel well, free. Uh, you know, it's Feel the last free. chapter. Something that stands out. It's called Finding My Father. Okay. Um, um, wow. The last paragraph. I know that my life, regardless of the troubles I have seen, has not been in vain. I can breathe now, and I know now that my life matters. If we can withstand our many falls and mistakes and efforts to sabotage and destroy our own lives, if we can withstand oppression, discrimination, hatred, and abuse from others, I'm talking about all of us, mm -hmm. sisters and brothers, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe, just maybe, we can come out of the harshness and magic of our life experiences as better human beings. I'm doing my best now, more than ever, to be better. My mother raised me to be a man. Time and again, she has told me to do the right thing. Finally, I can say to my mother, you were right, Ma. I know what the right thing is, and I'm doing it, Ma. I'm doing it. Can we talk about your mother for another second? Something that I was struck by so much was those moments, those challenge moments when she was like, boy, I don't know if you're going to make it. Uh -huh. mm. And that was like this resounding thing that came back. And I was so frustrated by you in this book. Like, I know. Every time you messed up, I, know. I was like, come on. I you're know. like, but, and, I'm, <laughs> and you're older than I am, but I'm reading this and like going riding with you at that I age that you it. were. Like, you're like my cousin that I just want to grab by the ear and be I like, know. get it together. You have all these things in front of you. So I wondered, why do you think you got so many chances? Mm. <sighs> Luck, faith, higher power, the universe, whatever yeah. folks would call that. Yeah. Um, but I also feel that, you know, uh, nothing, you can have all the talent or skill sets in the world, but if you're not really healed from the pain and traumas that you've got in, in your life when you were a child, you bring it into your adult life and you end up sabotaging yourself. I mean, look at the stories we've seen, you know, it could be Tupac, it could be Justin Bieber, Lindsay Lohan. I mean, so many folks that have gotten in trouble or have done stuff to themselves. It you know, appears like they have everything. Yeah, but nothing really prepares you for this spotlight that's on you or, you know, um, I just, you know, I wasn't ready for it. I was still dealing with my, my mother and our relationship was very complicated, you can see from the book. You know, there's love, but there's pain there. My father wasn't there. There was that pain there. There's the pain of poverty. You know, there's the pain of racism. There's the pain of so many different things coming at you from different angles. 
Uh, and I had to really figure out how to process this stuff, and it's not easy. You know, therapy is a huge part of this. This book, to me, is as much about mental health as anything else. Uh, I thought about, you know, Catching the Rise as I was writing this book. I thought about Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, mm -hmm. uh, the late, great Irish-American writer, Angel, uh, Frank McCord, who wrote Angel's mm -hmm. Ashes. You know, I thought about the diary of Anne Frank. You know, there's so many parallels between folks who are Holocaust survivors and folks who have survived racism in this country. Right. But it affects us, no matter where we come from. You know, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, uh, if you're a brother or sister who's from the LGBTQ, community, you have dealt with pain and trauma in some form in your life. How do you deal with it? And so I decided to just be honest and, hey, here's my mistakes. No, I know you're going to be mad at me. You were brutally honest. You know, like, it was all out there. My hope is that people will read it and not make the same mistakes, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, violence is not a solution for things that happen in our lives against each other, against mm -hmm. women, against gay people, anyone. Um, um, we got to figure out how to get to peace and love. That's what it really is about for me with this book, you know? Right. So at the very least, if you do make those mistakes, even though you've been warned, you know you're not alone. No, no, no. But we got to heal, and we got to bring love to this. I'm so clear about that now. So it's a good read. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. I think there's a lot of enlightening stuff in there. Thank you so much. You're doing the work. You continue Appreciate to do the work. So Appreciate it. tell us where folks can go to get a copy of the book, and tell yeah. us about the book signing that is not tonight. <laughs> it, it is Wednesday night, <laughs> Green Light Bookstore, 7 p.m., right here in Brooklyn, right on Fulton, right, right down the street from here. Right here. Uh, go to that store and support the bookstore. Uh, I support independent bookstores. They can go online wherever books are sold. I just yeah. say wherever books are sold. But I want to support independent bookstores in Brooklyn, so that's important to me. Excellent. What night. time is the signing? 7 p.m. Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday night. Wednesday yeah. night. We'll Thank remind you, you tomorrow. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.